All right. So today's topic, we're headed into the uh, some of the developmental disabilities that we're going to see um, with uh, that are higher incidence, and then we'll look at some of the developmental disabilities. The next module that are are uh, uh, lower incidence disabilities. What we, again, what we mean by higher versus lower, uh, these more occurrences of these than um, of the lower, dis lower disability categories, lower incidence. So we're going to look at intellectual disabilities and we're going to walk through what the definition is of intellectual disabilities. Then we're going to look at some case cases to understand, then we have a video of a teacher that is working with uh, students with intellectual disabilities. And um, I want you to be able to glean some strategies to know as a high school teacher working with these kids. So, all right, so here is the, um, what intellectual disability is according to the federal law and then Texas's uh, interpretation of that law. In general, the parents in our hub uh, had a lot of information. So if you guys that's a great uh, website to go to. I took that very uh, first item from directly from their website. It says intellectual disability is a term used when a person has certain limitations in mental functioning and such as communicating, taking care of him or herself, social skills. These limitations will cause a child to develop more slowly than a, typ a typically developing child. So that's the, um, that's just kind of an umbrella general, uh, description of what intellectual disability is. So when we get to the Code of Federal Regulations, it says this, and uh, let me move you guys up so we can see this better. There we go. Okay, directly from IDEA, this 34 Code of Federal Regulations, this is directly out of IDEA. And it says, uh, this term is used in definition of a child with a disability are defined as follows. Intellectual disability means a significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning existing concurrently with deficits in adaptive behavior and manifest during the developmental period. So um, that adversely affects a child's educational performance. And it was formally termed mental retardation. Then we got rid of the term mental retardation in 1994. And I forget the, what law it was, but it's about trying to remove the R word um, process so so it's no longer there. Um, however, retarded is, is around the day uh, and it's used as a derogatory term, right? We use retarded all the time. Well, that's retarded. Um, unfortunately, we use terms like that all the time. You know, for example, um, have you heard the term like well, he rides the short bus, you know, kind of thing, and being derogatory mean that they're a special ed student, whatever. So, um, I, just for fun, let's kind of talk about some terms that we've seen over over history um, that describes the same disability category. You've had the term moral. Have you heard of that one? And that usually is a descriptor of kids with Downs, most often. 
that they were going downstream. So the moron was one. And uh, so that was a turn. How about um, the term idiot? Do we still use that term today? Idiot. Idiot is an interesting term. It was back in the uh, time of feudal lords and kings and queens. And what they would do is the king would ride around and call people idiots, and then they would be taken and put into the um, into the prison, whatever, and taken away. What idiot means, actually truly means, is unfit for public display. And so idiot was a term used to identify people that were considered unfit for public display. So they were sent off to the uh, prisons. So moron and idiot, and they've been mentally retarded. And uh, uh, so those are some terms that we see around. So that's why we try to make it less uh, of a problem. And intellectual disability is one I would, my personal preference would be called cognitive disability because it's all about your thinking and processes and less about IQ level. So it's it's a broader thing, but that's just the idiom asking. Now let's look at the Texas Administrative Code. Um, intellectual disability, a student with an intellectual disability is one who has been determined to meet the criteria of intellectual disability up here. And has been determined to have a significantly sub-average intellectual functioning. Before we read on, let's just talk in here for a second. What does significant sub-average, significantly sub-average intellectual functioning mean? What does that mean to you? Does that have any kind of meaning to you? So for, um, let's kind of unpack that a little bit. Significantly, what does that term mean? Greatly, um, or drastic, drastic, these are great descriptors. Um, significantly means it, it, it's significant, it means, <laughs> yeah, how do you describe significantly with obviously the term significant, but it means a big deal, right? So let's just try to go greatly, drastic, it's a big deal. Um, sub average. What is sub average? Is that an interesting term? Sub, uh, sub average. What does that mean? Like, maybe like below, upwards of being below average. It, okay, it does mean below average because the prefix uh, sub means like subject is below whatever the jet is. But, uh, Points below that. Um, sub means below, like a submarine. Below the water, submarine. So, yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, so, average, so we have to have, we, the common folk, need to have this uh, defined, correct? We need that definition. We need that definition. Um, and we need intellectual functioning, sub-average intellectual functioning defined, right? So there's some definitions that we need to know before we can really make sense of that. And then if I start throwing out numbers, 
So let's say 100, 110, 70, 85. Does that have any significance to you guys? Okay. See? We have no clue. And then it's like here. Now then, this didn't give that significant sub-average definition here. But the Texas Administrative Code, it does. It says, significantly sub-average intellectual functioning as measured by a standardized, individually administered test of cognitive ability and IQ test. That's what it is. In which the overall test score is at least two standard deviations below the mean. Okay, so here's another term that we need to understand. What is standard deviation? Standard deviation, right? And uh, then mean. We need to know what does mean mean in this situation, not in not being nice, it means it doesn't mean everything. It's a statistical term, correct? You have different kinds of means. You have a mean, a median, and a mode. Who can tell me what the mean is? That's the statistical average, right? A median is uh, the middle potent point between a zero and a hundred, the middle point is 50, correct? So that's a median. And the mode is the most occurring number. So a mode could be many different things. So if you have really gifted people, then the mode could be way up on the high end. But if you don't have really gifted people, it could be way up on the low end. Right? So we're going to look at those in just a second. Then, it goes on, when taking into consideration the standard error of the measurement of the test. That's kind of a thing. My, my friend Lisa was the one that um, added, had them add that piece because our tests without error, all tests have error. And so IQ tests have error also. So most often the common, the standard error of the measurement is anywhere from uh, plus or minus two points to plus or minus, I think we've got one, 15 points. Which of those two tests would be more accurate? The one that has two standard error of the measurement points or one with 15? Two, correct. So we we kind of lean toward those. And those are like this the old time uh, ones like the Wexler IQ test, the um, Stanford Binet, um, the Woodcock test of cognitive ability, those tests. Then we get to some other ones that are not very good that we don't use very often. So um, so we have to take into the standard error of the measurement and then concurrently exhibits deficits in at least two of the following areas of adaptive behaviors, self-care, home living, social and interpersonal skills, etc. So we have to know not only are they intellectually uh, challenged, their challenge that is exhibited in their day-to-day -day life activities. And so we have to assess that. So let's uh, move on. We're going to look at what does significantly sub-average mean? So what I put up here, this is the um, normal distribution or the standard distribution. I don't like to use normal because it, it's, it's standard. It's not what's normal, what's abnormal. So. This is a standard distribution. So if we look at this, we see this number right here in IQ is the mean, median, and mode. And this number is, it's not only the uh, mathematical 
average, it is the most occurring number, the mode, and it is the median between this and the top end. So 100 is considered the average IQ for, uh, for the world, 100. These different lines mark standard distributions. That's where it's kind of like statistically, that's where that, that group ends. So the purple, or is that royal blue? I can't, it's an odd color. The bluish color here, 68.2% of the population fit into one standard deviation above and below the mean. 68% of the people live in that IQ range. And that is one standard deviation is 15 points. So from 100 to 85 is the low average that, well, average IQ range. So 99, 85, 87, those all would fall into this area here. 100 to 115 is the high end of the average range. But that takes care of 68% of the people. So between 85 and 115. Now if we go one more standard deviation below the mean, it goes down to the IQ of 70. So let's take the Texas definition. Um, at least two standard deviations below the mean, right? So using the Texas definition, what IQ would be um, where we need to start the process of looking at intellectual disability? 70 and below. So we'll look at 70 and below. And if you can see, that's only 2.2% of the population that has an IQ of 70 or below, correct? So that's a very small percentage of the population. Same thing up here. So it's, you've got a high, on the high end, 115, 130. If your IQ is above 130, you're 2.1% of the population, 2.2% uh, of the population up here. Now, Sheldon from Big Bang all of a sudden, he had 180 IQ, it was way up here. So, you know, he's, he's a joker. So we have the 70 IQ, and we have to take into consideration the standard error of the measurement. So if we take into consideration of the standard error of the measurement, say like we're using the Wexler um, IQ test, and it has a plus or minus two. If we got a 72 IQ obtained on the test, we could subtract minus two would that student be eligible to be considered for uh, intellectual disability? Yes, because we took into consideration the, the error, error. So, um, but 70 is the, the thing we shoot for. But it has to be concurrently. What does concurrently mean? happening alongside. So it means set this and something else is going on too. So it's happening at the same time. So you have to have a, a low IQ of 70 or below and concurrently deficits in adaptive behavior. So that has to happen at the same time. So that's important to take into consideration. So that's significantly sub-average intellectual function. That's how we're going to describe it. It's a statistical process. It means it's greatly below or drastically below the mean of 100. Make sense? 
uh, and it's only 2.2% of the population or less have it. So let's take a closer look at traditional levels of intellectual disability. Why these are the, we don't really use these definitions anymore because they really don't mean anything for us. It just, it's just numbers. It just, uh, it doesn't mean much. But usually somebody with a mild IQ, let's say between 50 and 70 IQ, they're going to be served in the general education classroom most often. They're, they're going to look normal, uh, look typical. I'm sorry, I didn't mean normal. They, they're going to look fairly typical of just everybody. And we'll look at characteristics here in just a minute. Then when we see kids in what we used to call moderate IQ, we used to call the, the mild and moderate educable because they could be educated in the general program. 35 to about 55 IQ, that's pretty significantly low. And they're going to start struggling and need a lot more support. Then severe intellectual disability is um, 35 to 20, and then profound is below 25 to uh, below 20. So that's the old traditional levels of IQ, and we don't use those very much anymore. What we do use is the American Association of Intellectually and Developmentally Disabled Individuals level of support. So we have intermittent, limited, extensive, and pervasive. Intermittent means that somebody needs, ever so often they need to be checked on to see if they're doing okay. Okay. Limited means more consistent. Uh, maybe you schedule once a week a meeting to make sure things are going on, or once a day, something like that, more consistent, but it's limited. Extensive means regularly, daily support. And then pervasive means every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So do these levels make more sense of what you would need to do in a classroom setting? If you have somebody with an IQ level of let's say 62, and they and they're pretty independent and can learn, and they only need intermittent support, which classroom, what kind of classroom is that going to look like? Gen ed classroom. But now then, if we get somebody that needs every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, support not only for uh, educational pieces, but maybe physical things like they have uh, uncontrollable seizures, they, they are not toilet trained, those kind of things. What kind of classroom do you think they're going to be in? A very significantly self-contained classroom, very limited um, interaction outside of that because they need the constant support. So right, so they have pervasive, and so it becomes interesting. So that's kind of looking at the needs of the individual, that's how we place them. So this makes more sense, correct? So this is what we use uh, when we make decisions about kids more often, not because just have an IQ score does not tell you everything about the kid. So like if a kid has high functioning autism where their IQ is like super high, but they need like physical support, where would they be placed? It depends. Very often they'll have a paraprofessional in the classroom. So her question, so for those of you guys online, was you have a child that is actually, has an intellectual ability very high, very similar, let's take your out of my mind book, Melanie. Yeah. Okay. Academically or educationally, where should she be served? In a general education. General education. classroom. However, she has physical needs and uh, assistive technology needs that are very pervasive, correct? 
But can those needs be met in general collection? Most of them can, with the support of a paraprofessional. So, so if they could be placed in that program and general ed with support, it'd be okay, right? A lot of people don't understand that. You know, I mean, that kind of drives me nuts because I see so many melodies when I go out and work in the schools. And I had a perfect example of one that when I was special ed director, there was a young man in the third grade classroom just sitting on, over on the side and, and doing nothing, he was in a wheelchair. And I asked about JR and they said, oh, his mom demanded that he was in the general ed classroom. But I, and it's like they had scored him really low on IQ and all this stuff. And, and I started watching him and he was bright eyed and everything. So we did a non-verbal IQ test and found his IQ was very high, like not he was a melody. So we got him an assistive device and he just blossomed and became he lived to tell jokes, so we programmed jokes in his, his device. It was had environmental controls so he could use his environmental controls, all those things. So it was quite interesting. But he needed some more support, more extensive support. In the general classroom, so it, it was we were able to serve them there, just like we would know. And so kid, uh, kids with that have and kids on the high end of autism, most often they're they're uh, just quirky. You know, they don't need a lot of physical support and um, need a lot of structure. You know, uh, they don't need a lot of extra support. It depends. And kids are different because you get all sorts of kids. You know? so, um, but we don't often see physical needs with the kids of the high end of the spectrum. And we'll look at autism we're going to look at uh, next week. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I'll move this out of the way. This is a uh, closer look. Individuals. This is the typical characteristics of an individual with what we would call mild intellectual disability. Are and let's just. This is a typical characteristic. So 50 IQ to 70 IQ. Um, I took this from a Minnesota website, so I'm sorry. I thought I put all the Minnesota references down. But okay. Um, kids with mild intellectual ability, they tend to only need intermittent or limited support. They typically do not look different than their non disabled peer peers. Uh, often have only mild, moderate developmental delays, except in academics, they might struggle a lot in academics. Um, Often they're not identified until they start school because then they notice that they're uh, not progressing as their peers would. Um, and I thought I took all the IMR references out. I didn't. Uh, mild intellectual disability means they spend most of the school day in a general classroom. Um, they're, they tend to meet third to sixth grade uh, reading and math skills. Uh, interesting thing is that the newspapers and magazines and, and websites are geared to a fourth or fifth grade reading level. Did you know that? It's interesting. So actually, they could pretty much engage all across the, uh, the world, wherever they're at. Um, uh, most often, these adults are independently employed. They need minimal supervision, and very often they'll marry and have children, and uh, we don't really realize that they're they have a cognitive display. Let's take a look at a particular student. Uh, this is John. Um, he's employed as a night janitor in a brewery. Let's see if we can identify some of those characteristics we saw over there. John worked there for eight years. And he started as a part time while he was in high school, so they did kind of a, a work study type of thing. So he's working in a brewery as a, a, 
in high school. He's married, has one child. He received, started receiving special ed in second grade. Uh, his IQ was scored 68, um, etc. cetera. Um, today, he's 72 IQ on the wet floor belt. So that's still in the 70 range. Um, and you can see parental uh, familial leave. His parents never finished high school, and his father worked as an unskilled laborer for the party. There's a lot of connections there. So do we see all those characteristics? They need limited um, supervision. They have, own, they have a job. They got married. Uh, they have children. Um, most of this stuff is in the general education classroom. That's typical, right? So now we're going to move on to uh, the uh, moderate to severe grouping. There you go. So we're going to move to the moderate to severe group. Um, they were called trainable way back when. Uh, let's, these are the characteristics. I'll read through those. This is where you're, you're probably going to see Down syndrome. Uh, if you've noticed, when we look at the different disability categories, Down syndrome is not mentioned, correct? It's because they're captured in the intellectual disability category. Uh, most of the individuals with Down syndrome are going to have an IQ below 70. That's very common. So a Down syndrome is not its own disability category, but intellectual disability captures it. Um, these kids are typically identified as infants and toddlers. Fetal alcohol syndrome is usually in this one because they it's a genetic, right? It's a, physical issues too. You see a smaller head, uh, wide eyes, uh, kind of alchemy shaped things going on in their, their um, the way they look. Um, they get most of their education in special ed, but they still get some in general ed. Um, most often a functional life skills kind of a program. And they can work, but they need to be in a supportive environment. Um, like sheltered workshops, which have been on the chopping block a lot, but it's uh, they're still there for, for individuals. So those are some things about them. So let's take a look at Mary. She's 19. Uh, she has a uh, 40 IQ. She's enrolled in adaptive living program, a life skills program at a high school. She has Down syndrome and was identified having conditions shortly after birth. She lives with her parents and, um, and they're looking at what things could be in the future. And uh, she'll move to a a kind of a semi-independent living arrangement, but it'll still be uh, supervised uh, group home. These are the one uh, situations where kids and individuals live in a, a regular environment, and there's like a six grade facility in the in the just out in the town, and um, so it's more like a home situation. Um, she was receiving services at age three and all this. So we can see all these characteristics that we talked about, about um, the moderate in merit, correct? Okay, so let's move on to uh, individuals with profound intellectual disabilities. So they're going to need pervasive support, most often because they're kind of like uh, around 20 IQ. 
very often they're going to have multiple issues involved. Not only will they have a cognitive piece, but they'll have physical pieces going on too. They won't be able to communicate. They'll be physically disabled. They'll they'll uh, be um, very uh, we need support from nursing staff, etc. These are going to these kids are going to be seen in the what we call the um, daily uh, life. I forget what they call them in high school, but we call them the the uh, pervasive classroom because they need pervasive help all day long, nursing help, medical help, etc. Those kind of things. So here's an example of Ronald, he's 23 and lives in a group home, uh, but it's a, a, it's a skilled nursing home. So there's nurses there all the time. He doesn't work, he, um, he can't work and um, Significantly delayed. His skills are very, very uh, delayed. Um, he has no speech. He has cerebral palsy. He uh, his only form of communication is to point to a communication board, and he can request simple things like he's hungry or needs uh, he's tired or something like that. So that's you see those elements in the previous slide. We see that in Ron, right? Okay, so existing concurrent learning deficits and adaptive behavior. So two of the following areas of adaptive behavior, communication, self-care, home living, etc., must be impaired. And we're going to watch a video of a classroom. And this is an excellent video. So let me see if I can get it up and running. is awesome. She's starting a brand new program for us and coming in as a brand new teacher. So what I want you guys to do, look at what's happening in this uh, video about what this teacher is setting up for her students and how that would be, how you can adapt that to a general education setting for kids that are on the higher end of, her, of this uh, disability. Okay. I would not hire someone as a brand new teacher to be in a program. I, I just think it's hard enough figuring out what to do when you're just beginning. Okay, so today is a block day. So we will start out with a long art class. But she's astounding. What impressed us the most was her attitude is always about what students can do, not what they can't do. Then we'll go out to the grocery store. And as soon as they get back, they'll go to lunch. Right after lunch, job skills, a reading lesson, and they go to gym class at the very end of the day. Pack up and go home. I, I just have so much admiration for this young teacher who just came in and took the bull by the horns. Um, here's our schedule for the day. The paraeducator can get here around 7 o'clock. So you can just go to the fundamentals like you always do. And we we'll wait for the bus. Good morning, Maya! Good morning, Mariella. Good morning, Marvin. School community-based students are students who have significant cognitive disabilities and sometimes 
physical disabilities as well, and they're not going to special centers. John, honey, you not feeling good? It's a busy day, and it's a long day. You guys go ahead. I'm going to take John down to the nurse right now. John, John, let's, okay, calm down. Let's go to the nurse, okay? Let's walk, buddy. And the nurse isn't here yet. Can somebody come and sit with him in the nurse's office? Okay. So, that's the, sometimes the way we start out our morning. Our morning. Hello, everybody. So the goal of the school community-based program is for the students to gain access to a general ed curriculum, mostly in reading, writing, and math. And then, of course, we have the community-based component so that when they get their certificate, then they can go on and be very functional adults. Do you need to walk to the nurse with me? Well, one thing that happens with my students, they very much can set each other off. So for instance, when John came in and got sick right away, that will frequently result in other students feeling sick all of a sudden or being upset. It's very intense the first year. You have a new teacher who is managing quite a few things at one time. Show me where your hands are supposed to be. Not on my head. That's right, Marvin. At your side. Let's go. Even in the school community-based program, expectations are very high for all students. So that puts a lot of pressure on teachers. Moving to the art class is always harder. I just wish it didn't happen first thing in the morning because this is my planning period. <laughs> One of the things I always take great pride in with Blake students is how tolerant they are. They're very accepting, they're very tolerant. And the response I see from our kids is, okay, yeah, there's kids in our school. Yeah, they may be a little different, they may have some different needs, but you know, so what, that's cool. Thank you for turning around, okay? Yeah. The rest did. of the day, no hug, hon. Let's do high five. Miss Luke here has those students seven hours a day. They're learning to be adolescents, so you have that kind of behavior. Because John's not feeling well. John is very to make a cart for him so he'll feel better. So she's going to be seeing a whole gamut of emotions throughout the day, probably most, more so than most parents would see. I really want them to be able to succeed, particularly in the workplace. All right, where are we going today? Grocery store. That's right. I think grocery shopping in particular is just a very important trip. It's an important place for students to be able to feel comfortable, and most of my students are working on different skills. So we'll say hi to the clerk. Hey. That's right, Miss Maya. I know. You're ready to go grocery shopping? Can? I don't know. What do you want to buy? What is that? Nothing. A cart thing? Good job, Tom. Why are you asking your question, Brandon? Where are salt? Uh, so. Go ahead. Good. Very good. Now, here's the part where we have to weigh something. Put them down. Every day is different. Every day I kind of have to attack the problem in a different way. So I'm still learning how to really address all of the academic and behavioral needs of my students on a daily basis, but I'm also, as a first year teacher, a bit overwhelmed by how much I need to learn just about the school system. Like what form I need, for which purpose, how to find the form, who to ask. I mean, those are things that I think are just going to come with years of being in the system. I have to go down and feed Maya. I like working with a lot of other adults. It's really nice because they're all very willing to give me feedback on how I'm doing and give me great suggestions with these kids. Sometimes you have to be so creative and I'll have somebody from Interact Com or the speech pathologist come in and I'll ask her, you know, how can we do this? I just, something's not working. Someone will have a great idea. So that's what the great thing about it is. The only thing I have trouble with is keeping it all straight. Time management is a major piece that we work with with new teachers because you're not just working with the student who you can mold but you're also working with another adult who has their idea of what should be going on in the classroom if i had a goal for the general ed students who come in contact with the school community-based students my goal is that they learn how to be comfortable talking to someone who's not exactly like they are i think it's really important to learn that when you're young that People who have disabilities are just like everybody else. I think I'll take because I want to make sure it works 
Can and you'll show me how to use it when oh, you yeah. come back? Yeah. Okay. Mike Walsh has been a, a very good resource for me. I'm a consulting teacher. And what we do is go into classrooms and support new teachers, novice teachers who are coming in. And we help them learn about Montgomery County's uh, standards of teaching. We help them learn about curriculum. We help them learn the ropes and supply any kind of supports that, that we can. The intent of all of this is teacher retention. The disruption caused by teachers coming and going certainly impacts the overall effect of our educational process. So we want to attract the very best teachers we can, and then we want to keep them. It's a whole network of people who are dedicated to ensuring uh, LAs as well as every other new teacher's success. It's the Alzheimer's Day report. Good, 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 good. I think the idea behind the Alzheimer's Day is that students who have disabilities should have access to the general education curriculum. And I think it's critical for the students too because they want to have benchmarks just like any other student would. Do you stay healthy by eating candy? No, candy's bad. Where's exercise? It's very helpful that my principal and then the staff here is incredibly supportive of this brand new program. That's helped me tremendously. And it's been a good stretch. Mr. Halley has been a great asset to this school and particularly to this program. Not only is he familiar and he knows what their quirks are and he knows how to work with them, but he's also just so enthusiastic. He loves working with school community-based students. One. Two, oh. three, seven, oh, yeah. I will have this cookie that I'm having. Watching Maya get on the bus is, is usually the last thing that happens during my school day. When Maya smiles at you for whatever reason or whenever it is, something's good. Something, something went right that day. That's what my classroom looks like at the end of the day. It's a shambles. Today was worse than usual. What they take on is very overwhelming. And there's a special place in heaven for people who teach special education. We need to make sure that we're also providing as many supports as possible for them. I think that's what will keep our first year teachers, keep Emily specifically, I hope. Right. Go, Chris, go! Bring it and lift your knees! When I come out here after class, I like to just, you know, joke around with the kids, kind of get in a few laps of running, and, you know, just kind of forget about my day for at least two hours. It's a major stress reliever. I love coaching. I'm really, really glad I made that decision. At the end of every day, I go home, and something crazy might have happened, but I almost always feel like somebody got something out of being in my class that day. That makes me feel good. Because the more that my students do and show people that they can do, the more people are going to expect them to learn and to behave beyond expectations. So let's open up our book. We need to see you reading. Okay, so um, what do you guys think? You like the video? Did you see anything in there that you can use in your junior high classrooms? Think about this. Um, she's got the whole day planned, but could you could you do something like that similar for your all your classes and have a schedule of what's going on that day in the class? And would that help? not only the kids with cognitive disabilities, but wouldn't that help everybody? Because you know, what do you know? Basically, all kids struggle with organizational skills, right? Well, that's an organizational strategy that can be used for everybody. That's called universal design. So you have a schedule. So that's something you can do with everybody. And so that's a lot of different things that's there. How to help the students interact communicate uh, with each other and with kids that are different than them, etc. is what was available. Anything else in that classroom that you saw that you could use in the general class? Okay, so there's a lot of things. So that's a good little video. 
again, this is posted in your content in this video. Um, this uh, PowerPoint is, so you can get there. Um, occurring during the developmental period. Let's talk about that for a second. What do we tend to think of as the developmental period for uh, kids? Do we think it's from age to, uh, birth to three, birth to five, birth to 18? What do we think? Maybe like in their 20s, because they're still developing, like developing cognitively. Right, but then they're adults at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of think. So we have to put a, a, a end time on it. I agree with you. I think that a lot of times we, we think it should be part of it. This one, in Texas and most states, when does a child become an adult? 18. So it's the developmental period ends at when they're 18. <clears throat> so we have to have an assessment that says they're cognitive delayed when they're 18. So but if after they're 18, then that falls into a different program, not idea anymore. So that's important. So from birth to 18 is when we talk about developmental. Causes of intellectual disability, this is just some generic stuff because the majority of them, we have no idea. But genetic conditions like fragile X or Down syndrome, PKU, which is a, uh, a diet of the, the mother, um, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome is the only uh, preventable um, cause because the mother just doesn't, just chooses not to drink alcohol. Um, and I don't know, there's not, uh, what is the safe level of alcohol you just have to avoid to get pregnant. There could be some things that happen during pregnancy. Uh, mother gets uh, German measles or something. Something happens in, uh, in utero, um, different things there. Problems at birth, maybe having a hard labor and they have an anoxial event where there's lots of oxygen. That can cause something, uh, intellectual disabilities. And then health, health problems like whooping cough, measles, meningitis, and those things can cause after they've uh, been born. So these are some causes, but the majority, like 50% or more, we have no idea what cause. And uh, there's not a it's kind of like autism. We don't know what causes it. Uh, occurrence, it's about 2% of the population. 7% of the special education population is served in intellectual disability, which is about 2% of the population in general. There's some signs, early signs. They don't meet their, their developmental milestones at the right time, um, and some other signs of intellectual disability. Educational settings that does the gamut from uh, least restrictive being the general classroom to the most restrictive being in a separate classroom or in a hospital setting. And here's some tips for you guys. Uh, learn as much as you can about intellectual disabilities. Uh, there's enormous differences between people, so you have to treat each other, each of those individuals with, uh, they're unique. Most often, the one thing that you can walk away from is that uh, you need to be as concrete as possible. They have trouble with abstraction. They have trouble with generalizing. So you need to be very concrete and actually teach the skills in multiple settings. At the end of, after we do autism on next week, we'll do um, task analysis activities to learn about uh, breaking things into the, the unique tasks for the students. They need immediate feedback, not delayed feedback, because they'll forget they need life skills taught. 
daily learning skill, and then work, they need to work very well with parents to uh, have a very broad program for them. So it's, it'll all be in the IEP. But you as general educators will, um, can help immensely with this with kids. Reminder, um, we have the Educate Peter video. And if you're interested, I have graduating Peter that I would like to have access to. It's Peter in middle school and high school. This is Peter in third grade. It's an excellent video. Um, it's uh, about Peter has Down syndrome and fully included in the third grade classroom. Very interesting video. Any questions about intellectual disability? You good? All right. Um, there's some organizations that you can uh, look at and check out. All right. That's it for today. Um, well, uh, next week, we'll start looking at autism spectrum disorder, the, the next uh, developmental disability that's on the schedule. And um, you have a great weekend. Try to, try to stay warm and, and safe and away from illness. <clears throat> Bye, guys. We'll see you all next week.